thank you very much, Marie and Theo. Thank you very much to the sponsors of this. I'm very much looking forward to the day and our discussions. Uh, and uh, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, <clears throat> what I want to do is, is sort of lay out some rather big themes uh, in this talk today. I hope uh, there will be all kinds of things that we can unpack in, in more detail. Uh, over the course of, of the discussions, both afterwards, um, today and uh, and tomorrow. Um, what I'm going to do is to first briefly summarize some of the arguments of my book, Common Democracy. I know it will be familiar to, to some in the room and perhaps not to others. Uh, I'll try not to take too long on that. And even in summarizing, I'll change what I said in the book, so it makes more sense. Uh, but then I will move on to a related topic that I hope will bring us back to, to the present and to the present situation in, in the Middle East and to ways and thinking about that and the kinds of tools that we can bring to making sense of indeed the, the quite desperate situation of uh, so many people, so many countries um, of the Middle East and of the, uh, of the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, this book, Common Democracy, can be summarized in one sentence. Uh, Cole, Cole created the possibility of modern mass democracy, and oil set its limits. Um, I became interested in those limits, like many other people who have worked on the Middle East, uh, over the course of the last decade, decade and a half, uh, even though my own uh, area of research has mostly been on Egypt, not one of the main oil producers of the region. As anyone teaching and talking and thinking about the region had to confront what seemed to be this relationship between <coughs> uh, the presence of very large amounts of oil and the difficulty of peoples of the region in mounting uh, democratic uh, claims to, to, to more democratic forms of life. And I, I was also motivated by immense dissatisfaction with the kinds of explanations that seemed to be available about this relationship uh, between, between oil and democracy. Uh, there were phrases about the oil curse, that somehow having all that material wealth in itself cursed you in some ways as a nation, as a state. There were more detailed versions of that argument, and often the form the argument took was around the notion of rent, and those of you who have studied this, um, in, 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 in political science, we'll know about uh, concepts of the, of the rentier state, the state that lives like a landlord of rent, um, doesn't have to live off the productive life of, uh, of, a, of a population, and somehow uh, that arrangement uh, leads either to forms of corruption or insulates the state from the demands of its population or gives it the the wealth to repress that population as many versions of the, of the argument. And I just found those um, arguments unsatisfactory because uh, they talked about the oil only after the oil had already become something else, had become money, had become resources in the hands of the state that would buy off opponents or arm the state and so on. And I was much more interested in thinking about, uh, initially, uh, the oil itself. Um, I was also concerned that those kinds of arguments that blamed the problems of the Middle East on this excess of, of, of oil um, tended to limit their analysis to, to those oil producing countries. Um, but of course, with all oil states, um, we have all come to live forms of collective life that depend massively on the availability of quite extraordinary amounts of, of, of oil. Um, and oil in particular over the last two, three decades that we have been consuming uh, at extraordinary rates. Um, you know, it's the case that half the oil ever burnt was burnt in the last 25 years or so. Um, and because of that, the problem of oil and democracy is actually a problem for all of us. Um, we all face the collective problems on the one hand um, that is extraordinary uh, rate of burning of, 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 of oil has um, rich, uh, causes the richest situation in which um, uh, almost all the cheaply available oil uh, was being used up and the 
new sources that had to be brought online to replace those were increasingly inaccessible, uh, even more destructive environmentally than the original sources, and uh, uh, resulted in oil prices that, as you know, reached um, extraordinary high levels. The whole phenomenon that is, re that is referred to, I think, quite accurately as peak oil. Uh, but of course, the other side of it, that in burning all that oil, in burning um, half, half the oil we've ever burned in such a short period of time, uh, placing it in the in the atmosphere and bringing on the threat of catastrophic climate change. So we don't seem to be able to deal with those strangely linked threats. So in that sense too, um, oil, is a, it, oil is a problem for democracy, not just for those countries that are having to produce a lot, um, but it seems for all of us who depend and who come to live is very um, carbon-heavy forms of life and don't seem to be able to find collective ways to move quickly enough beyond them. <coughs> um, coal, I said, so, so to understand this, I, I said, first of all just went back to coal and let me just re read the, the history of coal because I thought it would be interesting to think about the rise of coal. Uh, as the rise of coal, on the contrary, is, is, is associated with the very emergence of mass democracy, particularly the the great um, movements of, um, of, of working class organization in Britain and in other um, countries that industrialized with coal in the course of the 19th century. And roughly from the, 19, from the 1880s on um, through at least the first half of the 20th century, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the ability of organized workforces in industrialized countries to um, to successfully um, win much more egalitarian forms of life, to end some of the extraordinary precariousness of life by winning not just the right to vote, but using that right to vote to put in place forms of health care, forms of social insurance, uh, right to unemployment benefits, um, free education, all the, the great benefits of, of mass democratic life that emerge. Now, in general terms, it's known that coal is to do with industrialization. It was in industrial societies that mass democracy emerged. But what I argue in the book is that there's a more specific relationship. Because what happened with, um, first of all, the rise of coal in the basis of industrial society in the 19th century, and especially towards the end of the century, once one had um, transportation networks uh, and the use of coal to generate electricity, and <coughs> wide dependence on coal and simply um, as a source of steam power, was you had a very unusual moment in history. You had a moment where, for a number of decades, um, uh, organized workers could shut down entire economies. Uh, that was never possible before, and uh, it's no longer possible, it seems, today. But somewhere between um, the 1880s and then that moment in the, in, in the mid-70s that was uh, referred to uh, in the previous talk, uh, across the industrialized countries, uh, ruling classes faced that threat um, uh, of what was called the general strike or the mass strike, which didn't actually mean an entire country going on strike, but sometimes it did. It meant specifically this interruption in energy flows, something that wasn't possible before and had this extraordinary concentration of carbon energy moving along very narrow channels uh, from the, from, from, from the from the coal pit, uh, to the docks, to the trains, to the power stations, to <coughs> those sort of choke points at which you could interrupt the flow of energy. Um, one can think of the rise of oil, and in some sense the shift to oil, where they didn't exactly replace each other, that gets underway in the 20th century, both in the interwar years and especially after the Second World War, as um, the outsourcing of energy production. I mean, we're used to the no notion of outsourcing more recently, over the last 30 years or so, to talk about the outsourcing of manufacturing to other parts of the world. But what, um, what the addition of a second major source of energy with oil, and the increasing replacement and dependence on oil, was that um, the, the major energy production of industrialized nations, while continuing to use coal, was outsourced to other regions of the world. Um, industrial society had grown up where the coal was. It so happened that in most cases, the oil was somewhere else. And so 
rather than move industrial society to where the oil was, the oil which was easy in the ship, then coal um, was brought. But what you've done is you've taken this very contentious process of energy production and you had moved it offshore just as late with manufacturing. Uh, labor struggles over, over the manufacturing process. We moved up to the places where labor was cheaper, where um, unionization was weaker, and so on. <coughs> um, now, oil workers, like coal workers, were interested in struggling for better forms of life. And indeed, if you look at the history of uh, places where oil started to be produced, um, in the US, in um, in, in parts of the Russian Empire, it's now Azerbaijan on, on the Caspian Sea, uh, in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, in Iraq. Um, you find in, in intense struggles over uh, working conditions uh, from the 1920s and the 1930s onwards, in the case of the Middle East earlier, in places like the US and Russia. Um, the same attempt to build on struggles for better working conditions and better life, broader political movements. So in the 1940s and 1950s, you have uh, oil workers in Saudi Arabia demanding a political constitution, demanding the right to unionize. Uh, you find the same demands again and again in Iranian politics, in Iraqi politics. But you didn't find the same success. Um, and I think one of the major reasons for that different outcome has to be understood in relationship not only to the different history, but also just to the different properties of different kinds of, 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 of carbon energy and of the way they were connected into their places and their sites of use. Um, uh, oil tends to come out of the ground because it's under pressure. It, um, you don't have to send a workforce down under the ground so the workers are on the surface, they're more easily to it's easier to monitor and control them. And um, once it is out of the ground, it's a liquid. So it can very easily pint, very easily shipped. Uh, it can be put on tankers. The roots of tankers can be changed to avoid a place where there is a strike or some other political situation. So there's a flexibility to the networks um, uh, and an ability to avoid the forms of interruption or sabotage of supply that have been such a powerful weapon in the hands of organized workforce <coughs> in coal-based contents. You've also, because it comes second, because it develops after coal, it develops, as I say, overseas in a certain sense, in relation to the sense of industrialization. Um, so you just opened up that very distance between the place where energy is produced and the place where energy is used, which before might have been just a few dozen miles or a few hundred miles, and now it is over a distance of thousands of miles. So those who want to build political claims from the site where energy is produced are enormously disconnected from those working in the sites where energy is used. Oil workers in the Middle East find it very difficult to form political alliances, simply the very distances, among other things, with uh, other um, uh, progressive forces um, in Europe and elsewhere. Um, so for those kinds of reasons, uh, the shift from coal to oil, initially just the addition of oil, the second source of energy, uh, begins to enormously weaken the possibilities for uh, mounting claims for more democratic forms of life. Uh, so that to me seemed to me, uh, that, that seemed to me a, a better way to start thinking about the histories of oil and democracy than simply saying there was too much of it. Uh, so the, the, the simply saying you know, having too much of it is a problem. However, it was actually the case that too much of it was a problem um, in the following more specific sense. Uh, with coal, um, seeing it not from the perspective of the workers, but the perspective of the companies that owned it and produced it, um, in, in any business, one's always worried about competition and cartels are set up or produ producer arrangements are set up. Uh, in case of coal, the competition would tend to come mostly economically <coughs> just from the neighboring region. And, um, uh, and so you would set up 
some system to limit the amount of production among a group of producers. And I believe in the Newcastle area, even, even in the 13th, 14th century, uh, you had something called the limitation on the band. You had arrangements in place. Good. <laughs> uh, I had confirmation from an official source. The limitation on the band, arrangements in place to prevent overproduction. Uh, to prevent um, being put out of business by new rivals uh, coming along and producing more. Now, the very flexibility and ease of transportation of oil meant that it faced a different kind of vulnerability compared to coal. Because now, because oil could be moved around the world relatively cheaply in tankers and using pipelines, pumps, um, the threat you face from rivals was not just from those in the same producing region, but from anywhere across the world. Um, and so, as the new oil companies uh, by the late 19th century started realizing the enormous profits that could be made from oil, uh, they also found those profits to be extraordinarily vulnerable because a new producer could come along with a new source of oil and sell for less. Uh, especially if they were closer to markets. So that you suddenly have this opportunity for both extraordinary rates of profit, but also um, for being undermined from almost anywhere else in the world. And, uh, particularly thinking about 100 years ago, there were very few kinds of, perhaps no other example, of that combination of both extraordinary wealth, extraordinary profit that could be generated with that extreme vulnerability to um, the arrival of a cheaper supply. And so what those oil producers had to do, they were the ones who were now uh, vulnerable. Um, and what they had to do was to put in place, um, if you like, their own system of sabotage. If one wants to think of interrupting the supply of energy, whether used for um, democratic ends or used for uh, purposes of making profits as a sort of sabotage of the supply of energy and it, in the age of coal that power of sabotage was in the hands of, uh, of, of working class forces. Um, in the age of oil the power of sabotage develops in the hands of the corporations uh, because what they find is that in order to profit um, they have to be able to sabotage production anywhere in the world. Um, that is to say, to control it, to own it, or to prevent it from emerging. Um, and the form of that organized sabotage that emerges about 100 years ago is the multinational oil company. Um, you know, we assume that oil companies are so huge because oil is a big business. But there are specific reasons why uh, there was this extraordinary imperative of oil companies to operate on this global level. So the power of Sabotage <coughs> not only is weakened in the hands of workers on these ships to oil, it actually moves to, um, uh, to this handful of, of corporations that begin to look for ways to control the supply of oil on a global scale. Later they had to compete with producer states who take on the ability themselves to produce them. Uh, the, the history by uh, uh, the, the last third of the 20th century is different again. But, uh, but those, the, the, the possibility of limiting the supply of oil is a very important part of the history of oil in the 20th century. In fact, uh, one of the things I never realized in years of just sort of giving lectures on Middle East oil, if I had accepted this language, the, the extraordinary militarization of the Gulf. Um, and the American interest in maintaining control of the key oil production sites was to keep the oil flowing. Yet if you look at uh, large parts of the history from the 1920s, um, at least through to the 1970s and some way beyond, it was the opposite. It was to stop the oil flow. Uh, the great threat, at least to the American producers, the British were different, was that the oil would flow freely from the Middle East and the price would fall. Uh, and so if you actually look at the company records of what BP was doing in Iraq and what the American companies were doing in Saudi Arabia, uh, particularly in the, in the years either side of World War II, 
they're desperately trying not to produce oil. In, in the case of BP in Iraq, they're drilling shallow wells, knowing that if they stop, they won't find oil, and therefore they have fulfilled their obligations under their contract with the Iraqi government to, to look for oil, but not actually find it and have to ship it in significant numbers and risk lowering the price and undermining their own extraordinary levels of profit. So, this fact that oil is, is so abundant and so cheap to transport can be met partly by organizing a form of corporation that has this power of sabotage. But the other tack was to sort of work not on the production end, but the consumption end. And the way that these increasingly large and powerful oil companies worked um, was to do everything they could to develop more and more uses for oil. And that's the other way you deal with the threat of oversupply. And if you think about the way oil companies became invested in the business of, first of all, covering the countryside with petrol stations, um, publishing maps and guidebooks, and uh, every kind of incentive to start um, using cars, driving other uses of oil in other industries, uh, in the US in particular, working hard to um, undermine systems of public transport, buying up. Uh, urban transport co companies and then just shutting them down so as to force people to use cars and so on. Um, in other words, working very hard to produce these extraordinarily carbon heavy forms of life that emerged in the second half of the 20th century. But again, this is a sort of natural development of things, but, but actually were, um, were the product of very um, careful uh, thinking and planning um, on the path of the oil company. Now, that's a brief summary of some of the key themes of the book. Let me um, now move on to another part of the argument that I sketched briefly in the book and that I want to develop a little bit more today. Um, something else that happens in the same period of this shift to oil and increasing use of oil is um, people come to believe in the existence of an object they, whose, whose, whose existence they've never talked about and thought about before. And this object is that thing that we call the economy. And it's a surprising fact that no economist before about the 1930s ever referred to an object called the economy. They talked about wealth, they talked about material well-being, they talked about population, trade, cities, all kinds of things, and about how these things sometimes increase and flourish, and sometimes they, uh, they do the opposite. <clears throat> Somewhere in the 1930s, 40s, uh, economists develop a way of doing something different. They start talking about the totality of all these uh, material processes as a unified object um, for which they start to use the word the economy. It wasn't obvious that that was going to be the word for it. They might equally have called it other things. I can tell you some of the other words that were available. Um, economy was around. The 19th century was a steel of the economy, but economy meant management or government. Uh, it didn't have the definite article in the beginning of it. It becomes the economy, and it is, of course, represented by these new ways of counting flows of money, um, and particularly what becomes the, the forms of counting national income. It's a very arbitrary uh, ways of looking at things, um, and, and that are then codified as this thing called the GDP. The economy is related to oil in, in, in various ways that I try and explore in the book. Um, one of the most important is that what's distinctive about the new ways of counting is that you're no longer actually counting material resources, which earlier efforts to estimate material wealth were all about. You're, you're, you're actually counting the circulation of funds through the accounts on the model of business or firm. And in fact, it's just taking the, the economies devised as an object of thought by taking forms of business accounting and then imagining that everything that happens in the territorial space is actually just so many businesses. Some of it is, but also imagining households as if they were businesses doing the same kinds of accounting and so on. So with this new form of accounting, one of its features is that um, it can grow without limit. Before, economic thought was always concerned with limits uh, in various ways. But the thing about the economy is it grows without seeming to meet any kinds of physical material limits. It's been, in a certain sense, dematerialized. And um, 
I think that was enormously important for the kind of world, the kind of extraordinary hard, heavy world that was going to be developed in relation to oil in the period before and after, and particularly after, and decades beyond the Second World War. One had this idea of growth, the absolutely limitless growth. Forms of accounting, forms of thinking about collective life in terms of the economy, taking the, the, the economy and its growth as the central collective good in society. I think it's important that oil was around for that because one of the things about oil between the 1920s and the 1970s is that every single decade it became cheaper. So you were living in an era in which you almost didn't have to take into account the cost of has the single largest material input into any kind of, 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 of economic life. Um, I think what I want to do is sort of take that thought about the economy, trace it back a little bit, and, and bring it round back to this question of the of, of, of rent that I began with, this notion that somehow oil is a problem because it relates to uh, a sort of excess of income uh, that corrupts forms of politics. And I want to make that connection in the following way. I want to do it via a history of the corporation. Now, I've already given a history of almost everything that happened in the 20th century in about 20 minutes, and now I'm going to get even more in in about 10 minutes. So I'm going to go a little bit fast and sketch some sort of big ideas. Um, uh, <clears throat> I think one of the reasons the, the economy is way of calculating things, um, a very, very simplified form of calculation of the sort of national well-being comes into being, is it gives you a certain way to project the future. GDP, or the economy, as we say, in shorthand, can grow, and it can grow in this very measurable and very predictable way. Uh, and you can organize government policy around that target of growth. Uh, so there's a work of, if you like, sort of simplification and you can contrast that with the world of economic numbers that was actually sort of proliferating in the years before economists discovered the possibility of talking about the economy. That world of numbers was the world of um, uh, the vast forms of calculation that came to being with the rise of the modern business firm. Um, it varies depending on, on, on which country you're looking at, but those stories broadly similar um, between several countries in Europe and the US. I'll have the US example somewhat in mind in what I say uh, follows. But um, uh, uh, let me preface it by saying that um, you know, I find the corporation is an extraordinarily interesting thing to think about because it is this, it is this form of collective life that is everywhere, that, that organizes um, so many people's uh, uh, experience of well-being, and yet it, it exists in almost nowhere in our political theory, in our attempt to think about it. I mean, there are theories of a firm that come out of schools of business, that come out of law, and so on, but as a, uh, as a sort of central place in our thinking about uh, the nature of politics, we actually have not much in the way of the sort of uh, ability to think about how um, these forms of control, these forms of privilege, these forms of insulation from law, the ability to act as a person, we recognize all the things that corporation, a business firm represents, um, seem to be quite central to uh, a whole range of contemporary political debates. Um, at least in the US case, and I'll take as an example because I haven't got much time, the modern business firm comes into being in the 1870s, 1880s, for one main purpose, similar here too, and that's to build railways. Um, so it's actually related to this same history of coal and energy and so on. Um, and of course, after the rise of railway companies, the other very big form of corporation is indeed the oil companies. Now, usually the rise of the corporation, the switch from sort of family firms or partnerships to the, the modern business corporation, is just explained by scale. Uh, things, when you, once you had railways, once you had international oil firms, things were happening on such a large scale. You had to have the forms of organization that had some powers of control that were represented by um, the modern business corporation. Uh, I, I think there's a different perspective. 
um, that one can think of in terms of energy history, which is, and, and to think what was at the center of many of these uses of energy, uh, when one thinks of uh, railways and oil industries. Um, what came into being with coal, steam engine, iron and steel industries um, taking the form of railways was the possibility to build some very durable structure. One was now constructing things that had an expected life of 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. Very different from many earlier kinds of business ventures. Um, uh, an investment in oil in the same kind of time scales. Uh, which was both an enormous undertaking, but also an extraordinary future revenue. Because if you did it right, then you would be putting in place not just something durable in the sense that it was made of iron and steel and had all these rights of land and so on, but it would then return revenue to you, not over the, sort of the, the time scales of other kinds of business, but predictably over years and over decades. And what happens, what the modern business firm does, is it takes that future revenue, and as the economists would call it, it capitalizes. That's to say, it takes that revenue and sells it in the present. That you can buy you can buy shares in this future. And the whole history of the rise of the corporation, which of course was the rise of the stock market, the rise of the joint stock company, is the rise of these techniques for building durable structures, which are also durable futures, and selling those futures in the present. And what arises with first railways and then the building of oil industries, but also other large durable structures like dams and canals and uh, ports and many, many other forms of infrastructure, which is where these corporations come to being, is you have this extraordinary way of turning the future into a revenue stream in the present, something that had very little precedent in earlier economic life. To the extent it did, it was in things actually like colonialism, when you were also working on huge scales of distance and time, big colonizing corporations like East India Company were earlier examples of the corporation. And of course, um, those who undertook these ventures um, and those who financed these ventures found them to be uh, extraordinary sources of profit. Even in fact when they failed because you would have sold that, sold on that, that future revenue in the present. Um, the story I've just told is the story largely of how this happened in a number of key Western countries. Of course, the building out of these corporations in many cases happened outside the West. So the, the building of the investment in, in railways and canals and dams was often actually in places like Egypt, the building of the Suez Canal in the 1860s, the building of the first Aswan Dam. Egypt, in the, uh, by the end of the 19th century, had more railways per inhabited area than any other country in the world. <coughs> So it was, it, 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 it was a, a way of organizing finance and capital and durable futures that arose in certain places, but it wasn't confined to Britain or France or Germany or the US. It was a global phenomenon. And one of the extraordinary political struggles that's going to develop in the second half of the 19th century, of the 20th century, is exactly the control over the, the, the structures that have been built and the future revenue streams that flow from them. Um, they're so central to um, the forms of political life that come into being in the West <coughs> that, as I say, we've almost sort of taken them for granted. We don't even have in our political theory, I think, adequate tools for talking about this process that I began talking about as a corporation, but I rather think about as capitalization of this new technologies for taking the future and selling it in the present that emerge and with it the rise of stock markets and with it the rise of speculation, with it the rise of extraordinary profits and losses of swings. And in fact, I, I now see the emergence of the economy as the way of, sort of 
stabilizing in a certain sense this world by producing a much smaller, much more manageable object that government can focus on um, to, to almost obtain this, uh, this extraordinary speculative world of built out futures that comes into being in this hundred year period. Um, I said I was going to bring this back to this concept of rent. Um, I think it's important to think about histories of, um, of finance, the corporation, long-term revenues, because when we talk about the problems of the Middle East, of oil, of somehow too much money, of the corruption that follows, um, we're working with a couple of assumptions. One is we're contrasting that with an implies a normal place where money is raised out of productive activity, industrial, <coughs> the, 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 the making of things or the providing of services. So the problem with oil countries, or even what are seen as lazy countries adjacent to, in current German discourse, adjacent to the Middle East, um, is that wealth is being generated there in ways that do not actually correspond to productive life, the making of things, be it the generation of, uh, of services and so on. Yet if we actually think in the ways I sketched out what so much of the history of capitalism was in the West, it was actually uh, the building of what one can think of as systems of rent. Um, I mean, rent, I'm using it now in the technical sense, not just to mean the money you pay the landlord, but any income. Um, that comes from the control of some long-term, some structure that is going to give you some long-term revenue. And that could be a, a house or a building that you rent out, but it could equally be any of these other durable structures. So that that sort of character of rent, of income that doesn't seem to come directly from forms of productive life, and particularly rent from these long-term structures as they're sold in the present, is equally um, characteristic of uh, the forms of uh, life that developed in industrialized countries as it is in the, I would argue, in the, uh, the, the so-called um, you know, lazy countries or the countries that are accused of living off the rents from something like oil without doing any work. Um, you know, that implied contrast between rent as sort of unearned income versus the earned income of proper capitalist countries seems to me a very suspect way of thinking about histories of uh, energy, of the corporation, of where income uh, is produced. Um, so besides seeing these as actually more like each other than the, rather than places with the oil being somehow some strange exception to them, I think it's also important to see that um, in both cases, uh, I've just suggested they are alike in that they both depend on financial arrangements that seem disconnected from productive life. Right? <coughs> um, uh, one, because it's learned this way of selling the future in the present, the other, because of what he said about oil not really requiring huge amounts of, of work and so on. I think it's important to bear in mind that while they're similar in that way, they're actually both enormously dependent on forms of labor, on forms of working life. Um, you may have developed through the corporation ways of taking the future and selling future revenue in the present and getting extraordinary rich out of that. But that future that you're selling is still a future that has to be built and labored on. And the profits in the present will be reflected in the costs or the unviability of the people who've got to pay back in what they do in the future, whether it's going to be the price they pay for train tickets or any, any other form of future. Uh, that is being sold speculative in the present. Let me give you another example that will make this clearer. Um, 
as I say, the term rent suggests landlords and um, putting up houses or blocks of flats and earning income. And actually, if you go to that example, what I'm talking about is clearer. So let me let me actually talk briefly about how this building of long-term speculative, long-term futures, durable futures, and selling them speculatively in the present operates in the case of, of, of actual um, housing. And it's not one that connected to the story of oil, let me just say in parenthesis, because of course earning all that money from oil in the states of the Gulf or other states in the region that receive oil income is no good, it's just cash, you've got to do something with it. And the primary thing you do with it, as almost anywhere in the world when you're getting a lot of extra cash, is you put it into, into real estate. You put up apartment buildings, you put up hotels, you put up tourist things, whatever you can. And that's why you would have Dubai and Abu Dhabi and Qatar and even Cairo and Beirut and so on. It's an incredible uh, 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 sort of speculative building of the capital cities of the region. And also, of course, to buy and offer properties in London and New York and so on. Now, um, you can do that. You can put your money into building, throwing up a building. And you can. Um, uh, enormous profits from that. Because what you do, of course, is you immediately sell on the units of that building, the flats, the apartments, to other people. Uh, and you, as the speculator and the developer of this site, earn a profit in the present that is far beyond the cost of you putting up the building in the right kind of speculative environment. Um, the people who then buy on those apartments do so uh, in, in the context where the whole of the speculative housing in the future. Eventually, what you get is a speculative housing market, uh, housing becoming more and more affordable. Um, and what that means is that people, and this is very much a situation of people, say in Cairo or Beirut or many other um, uh, capital cities of the Middle East. Uh, People who want to buy their first apartment now find that instead of having to work for five years or ten years to earn the deposit to put down an apartment, might have to work for 15 or 20 years. So in other words, that speculative world of rent and speculative real estate, the production of rent, is being paid for, but it's being, and it's being paid for in people's working lives over that five or ten or fifteen year period, but it's being realized in the present by those who have organized the financial mechanisms to uh, build the long-term structure that can be discounted and sold in the speculative present. So we have this notion that rent, whether rent from oil or rent in a literal sense from uh, building apartment buildings or rent in any other, is, is somehow disconnected from productive life, is the opposite of people being organized to live productive lives. But in fact, all those people toiling now 10, 15, 20 years longer to be able to afford to buy somewhere to live. In their productive lives, they're at work in producing that wealth that is available through these durable structures. Um, so, let, let, let me just recap and conclude. Um, as I said, I'm sort of, <coughs> sort of trying to retell the history of capitalism now as well as the history of energy. But I think it's quite important for thinking about um, uh, these things because I think we're working with these inadequate notions of um, uh, problems to do with this sort of surplus wealth and the Middle East and not thinking about how it connects into our own lives and our own history and the history of capitalism. Um, so, uh, I, I suggested the coming into being of the economy, and that was the argument I was making in the book, but now what I'm suggesting is that we think of that as a particular moment in economic theory and public thinking that was actually just a smaller part of this other process of the coming into being of the modern corporation, the modern business firm. And the modern business firm has this particular history tied to the history of energy and the kinds of uh, industrial transformation that are about the ability to build and control, there's a political side there, these long-term futures and then selling them speculatively in the present. And that 
um, in thinking about forms of economic and political life in the Middle East that seem like sort of distorted versions of, of, of things that are actually much closer in certain ways to the kinds of histories um, one could tell of, of, of finance and capital in the West. But to conclude, I want to take that a little bit further and relate it to the um, uh, question we were going to talk about tomorrow a little bit, which is the question of debt, because of course all these are about histories of forms of debt, right? And that's what these, uh, uh, the, 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 the ability to build these long-term futures depend on new arrangements of credit and debt. And I've talked about them mostly in periods when you built out these long-term futures by building quite solid structures like railways or oil industries. Um, nowadays, and particularly since the 1970s, and in ways that are not unconnected to the history of oil, uh, it's possible to build out other kinds of technologies that do similar things, and that work differently um, because they don't actually necessarily need um, large-scale structures of iron and steel and steam power or even uh, internal combustion. Um, now, the underlying logic here always is one, one's looking for histories of, of things that have durable futures that you can organize in such a way that you can speculate and make profit out of that future and the present. And you know, there's, there's, a, there's only so many times you can do that with railways and then they're replaced by other kinds of things. But one of the things that develops, I think, since the 1970s is an entirely new kind of durability, a new kind of sort of long-lived structure that can be turned into a source of revenue or, put it another way, a long-term repayment of debt. And that is human life. Um, because what happened since the 1970s is that um, financial arrangements are organized such that individuals can now lay out their own lives as a kind of long-term financial project rather than analogous to building railways a century before uh, through the proliferation of ways of going into debt. So it's spread of credit cards, it's spread of new forms of home loan lending, both first mortgages and the bubble, second mortgages. Um, so that um, <coughs> as people struggle to maintain standards of living and find that the only way they can do that is by borrowing, either on credit cards or on debts um, attached to a property, or of course now borrowing to go to university. Um, that long-lived structure that you're building out isn't a railway or a canal, it's actually your own life, um, which gets structured as this system of payments, paying back that debt over time. Uh, and that gradually becomes um, a form of life, but also then a form of finance. And so the what in the past were stock markets that were built up around buying and selling shares in railways that were in oil companies and in other kinds of companies, find that they can actually become stock markets that speculate in these human lives. Because if you think about the things that built up when they came the 2008 financial crisis, what were they doing? They were essentially taking credit card debt and home mortgage debt and repackaging it and selling it. So the ways in which people can turn themselves into debtors, into lives that were going to be the long-term repayment of debt, becomes the new thing, like the railway booms of the 19th century, that you can repackage and resell. So there's an exact parallel between the way we've come to live our lives uh, of the last generation, organized around personal debt, to the kind of forms of debt of of what we think of more classically, of the age of, of, of large-scale corporate investment. So, um, once we can think of debt in those terms, whether we've taken it on as credit card debt, or having to mortgage our home, or 
mortgage our future education. And then, of course, there are other ways that happens because um, as profits increase uh, for those profiting from these processes, um, <coughs> there are other things that used to be paid for in common that you've also got to start borrowing for or at least denying yourself compensation for, so health care um, as well as education. Um, retirement, when it used to be enough to expect a state pension, you now have to think about all those. So in all these ways, um, the, the, the very trajectory of human life becomes a series of payments of the time that is analogous to the, the payments received by a railroad company in the 19th century. It's a future that is laid out as a system of debt and credit that can be capitalized and sold in the present. Um, what's that going to do with the Middle East? Well, first of all, because these same things happen there uh, in different ways. But often they happen because uh, the way debt is taken on has been taken on in many countries of the Middle East and um, uh, of the Eastern Mediterranean is government debt. And of course, that is just another way of organizing the same set of relationships because then you're paying your debts over many years, um, not as a personal credit card debt, but as the austerity that is imposed on you. Uh, the things you are told you can no longer have in wages in healthcare and education and everything else because as a collective you have been put in this long-term relationship of debt. So um, 